Okay guys, this is Fight Commentary Breakdowns, and this is probably going to go on Fight Commentary Chats, although we might put some of this on Fight Commentary Breakdowns. Anyways, we have Antonio here, also known as Brooklyn Monk, and uh, technically we should call you Dr. Antonio Grissifo, <laughs> right? <laughs> you could. <laughs> mm -hmm. But usually people just call you Brooklyn Monk or Antonio. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Cool, That's fine. cool. So Antonio, Brooklyn Monk, and shout out to Jordan, Jordan Chow, for connecting us. So Jordan, thank you, man. So, dude, um, Antonio, let's go through your process. I mean, you spent a lot of time in Asia. What started kind of that love for Asia and martial arts? Was it your childhood? Was it your high school or was it college? Tell me more about that. I'll tell you the, the two big things. Number one, when I was a little kid, I my uncle used to have to take care of me sometimes because my, my grandma was working and he would watch the TV show with David Carradine, Kung Fu. Mm -hmm. So, you know, because, you, you know, I'm 53 years old, right? So I was like six when that TV show started. So my uncle would watch that and I'd watch that. And I just thought it was so mysterious and mystic and Shaolin Temple and all that. And then I got bullied a lot at school. Mm -hmm. And then my family moved down south from New York. We're, we're Italian. I don't know if you noticed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we moved down south and like I was the only Catholic, the only Italian, the only like immigrant, the only... Oh, you know, New Yorker, they called us Yankees, like they were still fighting the Civil War and all that. And I just got beat up every day. And I was like really outspoken and I was really small too. And it was like, it was like, like a perfect storm of, of bully fest. Oh man. And these, these guys would, would beat me up and they'd be like, you, you darn New York Jew Italian. I'm like, <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. And, and I would correct their grammar. <laughs> Oh, that will definitely get you beat up. Yeah, no matter what, man, that will definitely get you beat up. <laughs> Sorry, I don't grammar. need to laugh like, or make light at that. <laughs> my dad, my dad, so my dad remarried and, and my stepmom would say to me, well, can't you just not say things that upset them? <laughs> yeah. My dad's like, no, no, my son's going to say what he's going to say. <laughs> yeah. You want to say anything you say, you're going to take it, you know, you're going to take it ass beaten, but, uh. <laughs> Dude, yeah, yeah. Your, your dad was that uh, type of Italian, um, you know, really good. I mean, that, that builds character as much as I'm sure it wasn't fun. Wow. Yep. So, and then, yeah, and then there was one other Italian family living down there in Tennessee, and, and that kid got picked on too. So his dad told my dad about the martial arts school, and so I started martial art when I was 12, and I loved it. And my teacher, it was called the fire and water system of Kung Fu, and his whole thing was that he had studied – Kung Fu overseas and his master told him when you go back to America, remember that you're teaching Americans, you're not teaching Asians. He goes, so you got to make it American Kung Fu. Oh. So he changed everything. And it was mainly kickboxing. And you gotta yeah, by then it's like 1978, right? Mm -hmm. 79. And you know, Chuck Norris is like the baddest man on the planet, and he's doing point fighting, <laughs> you know. And so martial arts really still had, while it had a mystique, it had kind of a bad reputation too, because everybody knew a Taekwondo black belt that got beat up. Mm. And we all kind of believed that professional boxer, like there was just no contest. I mean, if you took, you know, uh, Holmes, Larry Holmes or somebody, and you put him in the ring with like some Taekwondo black belt, like Larry Holmes was just going to destroy him, you know? And we didn't know about wrestling. We didn't know wrestling was martial art, but... Um, but my teacher, so he, he taught us kickboxing and black belts would come from other schools. They want to fight with us. My teacher would say, do you understand? We really fight. And they were like, oh yeah, yeah. We really fight in my system. I, you know, no, 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 no like we're really going to hit you and stuff. <laughs> like, like they just couldn't, couldn't even conceive of such a thing. Like how many of these fights ended? The guy got hit one time and he was like, he was like <laughs> you, know, yeah, you can't do that. Yeah. It was like, that's why, that's why when I saw your videos of the shoe shot down fights and stuff, I was just cracking up. I'm like, I've been there a thousand times. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's how I got started. And then, uh, did martial arts with him and he, he was a um, returning Vietnam war veteran. And so he encouraged us to go in the army and all that. So I went in the army when I was 17 and wow. went through the infantry and uh, I boxed in the military. And then uh, I boxed all the way until, yeah, I stopped for a few years when I went to university and then I started boxing again. And then, uh, and then when I came to Asia, well, after 9-11, I decided I was going to go to Asia to go to the Shaolin Temple. And that was my plan. I wanted to go to the Shaolin Temple because I dreamed about it my whole life. And I said, oh, I'm going to go do this. So I went to Taiwan, studied Chinese, studied Kung Fu. 
then went to the Shaolin Temple, came out of the temple, wrote the book, The Brooklyn Monk, and then. <laughs> I see. So, <laughs> so you were in the Songshan. You were in the that one, that Shaolin, like the the old oh, yeah, Shaolin yeah, Temple. Yeah. So, wow. Songshan, Shaolin, and the other thing, Jerry. The weird thing about my experience, it's very unique. Now, Matthew Polly is, is is a really good friend of mine, and I I have so much respect for Matthew Polly, and his book did so much better than mine, and. And if you're going to buy one or the other, buy his. But uh, <laughs> but uh, really interesting experience is that I actually lived in the temple for the first, just for the first few days, but actually slept inside the actual real Shaolin temple, which almost no one has. And then I slept in the monk quarters uh, with the monk there. And then they then said to me, well, you know, we all have schools outside. I didn't understand how it worked. It's like a franchise. Yeah. The, each of the monks has like his own school outside yeah. and that's where his students live. Yeah. And that monk wanted like a thousand dollars or something. And this was 2003. Like that was a lot of money in China in 2003. And yeah. I said, no, that's ridiculous. And then he goes, well, how much do you want to pay? I go, I don't know, like 200. And he goes, okay, I'll find you a monk. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I wanted and to the thing is, he was definitely over, gonna overcharge you, right? So it was good you bargained it down. You probably could have gotten away with a hundred, even. In the book, in the book, I just kept writing things like these people have never even heard of Brooklyn. <laughs> yeah, they don't know Brooklyn. I mean, now maybe in the 2020s they've heard of Brooklyn, but yeah, um, they definitely didn't. I mean, they knew New York in the 2000s, but that's it. They didn't know Manhattan versus Brooklyn versus Queens and all that. Honestly, what, what they didn't know was was staggering in 2003 because there was no internet. Yeah. You know, essentially no internet. Essentially, you know, and, and, yeah. there was, and there was no WeChat. There was no WeChat, no smartphones. Yeah. So what you had was QQ. Yeah. And people didn't have internet. So maybe they'd go to the internet cafe once a month, once yeah. a, you know, whatever, send a message to their friend. And then they only knew other Chinese people, of course. Yeah. And um, there was no access to information. There was no cable TV. They'd never heard of MMA. They'd never heard of UFC. They didn't know anything. So they really believed a lot of the nonsense, yep. you know, and that that's also what drew, drew me to your videos. You know, it's yeah. a, that I wound up, I came to Asia with like this open mind about there was going to be this mystical master on a, on a mountaintop. And, and the longer I was here, I just went like, uh, there's no, <laughs> no, no, yeah. no. And now I'm in Mongolia and I mean, they're phenomenal fighters, but not because it was some mystical master on a mountain. They're phenomenal fighters because there's brutally tough, rugged, strong people that fight all the yeah. time yeah exactly yeah exactly wow so so you were a shell in you trained did you go in you know you boxed throughout the army and stuff did you go into combat sports whether in an amateur or professional way tell me about that so i had about 20 i don't remember the number now maybe 24 fights when i was in the military and i had one draw all the rest were wins mm -hmm. And um, then I had one, one amateur, after I came out of the army, I did one amateur boxing fight. I was in North Carolina training with a boxing coach and he put me in an amateur. He goes, well, you don't have an amateur record. Let's put you in an amateur fight. And I'd never been in an amateur fight. So the first two or three fights he put me in, the opponent didn't show up. And there were only two people in my weight class. So somewhere there's a record that I'm like the champion. <laughs> I won by default like nice. I don't know I didn't even collect the, the trophy though I was like no was like and then I had only one fight as an amateur and I lost mm. I got absolutely destroyed um I weighed I was walking around at like 90 kilograms and he signed me for a fight at something like 68 kilograms or something preposterous Oof. like that that's a big weight cut insane. man I had to lose like 30 I don't remember now and no, it wasn't quite that big maybe it was I was walking around at 190 and he signed me at Six, 168 pounds maybe that, I remember it was like 30 pounds and I actually tried to lose it and you know and when I got in the ring I threw zero punches that they, they actually stopped the fight because I didn't throw any punches mm, because the and, world was um, spinning right oh yeah oh, it was like that the old Bugs Bunny do you remember the old Bugs Bunny when he goes in the the mad scientist lair and and the beaker of ether drops on the floor and they're in this like ether and they're trying to run <laughs> that's what it's like and it was horrible. And um, it's the only time I ever had a uh, like an amateur fight in the state, like a real amateur fight. And that was the only time I ever cut weight. And then after that, I said, I'm never cutting weight. Good. I, go, I Good. fight at my weight. And I've fought at my weight ever since. And um, then I came to Asia, went to Shaolin Temple, and I, you know, mixed it up with those guys there. Tried to 
get a like I've been living in Taiwan teaching and came out of the temple got stuck in Hong Kong because of the SARS we couldn't go go back to Taiwan for a long time I found a job in Hong Kong for briefly they paid me out and then the and I got that money and I just couldn't work anymore like once I'd been in Shaolin I just couldn't like do the job thing because it was just so many other things I wanted to do. Yeah. I used to joke with my friend, like when I watch National Geographic Channel, it's like watching a Sears catalog where I'm going to pick out all the things I want to do, you know, and I wanted to cross a desert and I was trying to figure out how to go to the open quarter of the Sahara or something. And, and like, it was just impossible. And then I'm like, oh, geez, China has deserts. So next thing I know, I'm in the Taglamacan desert, you know, crossing from uh, Xinjiang to Kashi, with a with a San Lung Chu nigga three wheeled bicycle. That's right. Came out of that, got back to Taiwan, was able to hold down a job for about two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Just couldn't do it. You know, I turned on the TV and I saw this documentary about this monk in Thailand who was fighting the drug war in in Burma. The, you know, the, there was a civil war going on. It's being funded with the sale of methamphetamine. So there's all this methamphetamine flowing into Thailand from Burma and the hill tribe people, they'll pay them like 20 baht to walk across the border with like 50 kilos of methamphetamine. Wow. Or like 20, 30 baht, you know, like, like a couple of dollars. And of course, the, the way it works, the generals in Burma control the drug trade. The police in Thailand allow it to happen. Mm. You have to allow them to catch somebody once in a while so that they can, you know, get a promotion. And so these people would just get, you know, thrown to the wolves, three, four dollars walking across the border, all these drugs, they get arrested or they get killed. They got killed a lot. Very often they got killed because the cops then figured out, well, what we could do is we'll kill them and we could take half the drugs. There'll be nobody who knows how much drugs there were and then we'll sell the half to drugs. Wow. So, yeah. So this was going on. So there was this, this monk living in the forest and he started, uh, somebody brought him a horse because you bring gifts to monks. They brought him a horse. And he's like, what am I going to do with a horse? So he goes out riding the horse and he's riding along the Burma border and he gets to a town and there's like dead bodies and there's drug addicts and this is horrible. And this woman says, can you take my son to your temple and teach him? Because I don't want him to, to wind up dead. So at first he was like, no. And then, and then he's like, okay, I'm a monk. I have to help people. So he takes this kid and then eventually he gets a horse for the kid and they go riding on the horses and they go to another village and they're like, can you take my kids so they don't get killed? And so next thing you know, he winds up building this, this monastery in the jungle and all these kids, like they're all traumatized because their parents were murdered or their village was burned or they're addicted to meth. Tons of them were addicted to methamphetamine. So he starts teaching them Muay Thai as a way of wow. getting them off of addiction. So I see this on TV and I just want, I have to, I, I have to find this guy. So I fly to Thailand. I had a picture of him. The first thing I ever downloaded off the internet in my life was a picture of this monk. I actually had to get somebody to help me do it in the internet cafe in Taiwan. I got this grainy black and white photo. It says Chiang Rai. <laughs> so I, get it. I just like get on a bus, get off. The, the guy is like, this is Chiang Rai. I'm like, okay. And I don't speak a word of Thai at the time. And I just get off and I'm just showing this picture. I walked around for two days showing this picture to people. And then one, it's like, I just sat down at a gas station, kind of like threw my hands up in the air, like, what am I going to do? And also I figured it's a gas station with lots of people coming. So everybody who bought gas and showed them the picture. And then this mm. one guy goes, he, yeah. And of course we couldn't communicate, you know, but he goes, you know, basically said, get on the back of my motorcycle. And he drove me all the way up the mountain to the monastery and just dumped me there. And then I met Prakruba and I wound up living with him for a number of months and learned that he was my first Muay Thai teacher. I learned to speak Thai and um, eventually came out of that monastery and what happened? Yeah, then Cambodia and then just on and on and on. Cambodia, I heard about the traditional martial art there that was dying and I went there and followed up book tour. It took me a year to find the master and then I studied under him and, and then somewhere around 2011 uh, and then Martial Arts Odyssey started started in print with Black Belt Magazine, uh, 2003, and, and uh, Kung Fu Magazine, 2003. Those were my first publications. And then I was writing regularly for them until about 2007. Then the video series started, Martial Arts Odyssey. And, um, and uh, what happened? And then the book came out, The Monk from Brooklyn came out 2000, I don't remember what year. And then Warrior Odyssey came out around 2010 or something. And then somewhere around 2011, I was 
filming in Malaysia and got to meet a lot of people. And then somebody called me and said, do you want to come fight in a, uh, no, they said, do you want to be the guest celebrity referee mm -hmm. for the first ever professional MMA tournament in Malaysia? And I said, no, I want to fight in it. And I was mm -hmm. 40, whatever years old, I was 42, 43. And uh, so I went and I fought in Malaysia, two fights in one day. I won the first one. I lost the second one. And it was like the perfect thing to have happened because if I'd lost the first one, I would never have fought again. Mm. If I'd lost both of them, I'd be carrying that <laughs> undefeated <laughs> pressure. It's like, all right, I really lost one, but I know I'm capable. And so that's it. And that's how I started fighting professional MMA. Wow. Wow. And so you mostly fought out of Malaysia? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But all, all my pro fights were in Malaysia, I think. I had like two pro boxing fights in Thailand. And um, yeah, when I was living with Crew Ba, we went to fight in like a, a temple fair in uh, up in Chiang Rai, like northern Thailand. And um, and I, I couldn't fight Muay Thai. It's really nice. I hung around Thailand and Cambodia training for years and it improved my, my Muay Thai. But I just never, ever thought that I should go fight a professional Muay Thai fight. Mm -hmm. I just did not think that was a good idea. And um, so we went to fight in the Temple Fair, and so they arranged a boxing fight for me on the mm -hmm. card. So I fought one there, and I fought one down in Hawaii, uh, Hawaii, nigga, uh, professional boxing. But uh, but all, but my real fights are my MMA fights, and that's that's all all out of Malaysia. Then uh, toward the end of that year, I lived in, in the academy in Malaysia, like slept on the floor, basically slept in the cage for like a year, training full time, fighting full time. Toward the end of that year, it was like, I just kept getting in, you know, it, it, not even that I was getting injured. It was that my body was wearing down because I lived in the academy. There was no way to get a break. And, and they trained seven days a week. There was mm. just literally no way to get a break other than if I just said, I'm not training tonight, but then what? I'm going to sit there and watch everybody else train. Yeah. And there's no way to recover from, from injuries. And so like, like my elbows went and I couldn't throw punches anymore, mm. but I was still fighting. Mm. and then my knees were bad so I couldn't kick but like I was still fighting and then okay well I could wrestle so I, was, I kept wrestling and then and then the like one of my last fights in Malaysia my back went mm. and I said okay well I can wrestle but I can't lift my opponent and like that's all I had walking into the fight like I knew I couldn't throw punches kick <laughs> wow <laughs> the, the body was just you know and so I went online to look for a job and, and could not believe I landed a job at Shanghai University as a lecturer. So I flew to Shanghai, started teaching. And while I was there, I met um, two PhDs who gave me a lot of really good advice. And they told me to pursue my PhD. And um, we had a day off and I went to the sports university. Oh, this is crazy too. I posted on Facebook. I go, there's apparently a sports university in Shanghai and they have a wrestling team. I'm going to see if I can go wrestle there. And somebody on Facebook who I've never met wrote and goes, oh, my wife knows the director. I'll give you her phone number. So they gave me the phone number of the director. I called her. So she was expecting me. I went there to talk to them about wrestling. And by the end of the meeting, she goes, oh, your Chinese is really good. Do you have a master's degree? I said, yes. She goes, um, do, do, do you want to uh, have a full scholarship for your PhD and come wrestle here? Mm. Yeah. And so that's how I got in Shanghai University of Sports. I ended up spending three years there. They, it was a four-year PhD program. They waived the first year because I tested out of the Chinese. And because I walked in with a really, a really good idea of what I wanted to research from mm -hmm. day one. And um, yeah, I got through uh, three years, graduated that. Had some amateur fights while I was in. I think I had about 11 maybe amateur fights, Sanda, MMA, boxing, while I was um, in my studies there. And then, um, and then, and then I had two pro fights in 2019. So wow. yeah, just before all this nonsense started with the pandemic, I had two mm -hmm. pro fights and we're planning another one in the fall of 2019, but I got a staph infection. Mm -hmm. So we moved it to, um, we said, well, we'll do it in early 2020 and then 2020 the pandemic started. So I didn't get to, to fight again. I see. I think the natural segue would be, what was your research topic about for your PhD? My research topic was um, so it's a cross-cultural analysis of Western and Chinese wrestling. Wow. And really interesting. I published the, on the, on the dissertation, I let them tell me any changes, anything. I didn't find anything. Oh, you want me to change that? Okay, well, I'll change it. I'll change it. Didn't care wow. because I felt like the dissertation is theirs. They're going to prove it. 
I have to just let them do whatever they want. I don't care because I just wanted to graduate. But I saved all my notes and then I wrote the book, The Wrestler's Dissertation. And that's been published in English in the United States. And so that was like my heart. That was what I wanted to write. And I absolutely don't care that my, you know, PhD dissertation doesn't match that, you know, it's, dissertation is like, unre it's completely unreadable. It's the most boring thing anyone's ever written. And, um, but, uh, but yeah, the wrestler's dissertation was my heart. And now I've got a publisher who's asked me for a book about my three years at the sports university. So I'm working wow. on that right now and I'm supposed to turn that in on June 30th. I see. I'm, um, I'm going to save all of these, these books you've written in one of my Amazon lists so people can look at it. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. You put it on your wish list so your fans can buy it for you. Yeah, for exactly. <laughs> exactly. I have like idea lists so that I can create. So this is perfect. Wow. Well, the Marshall so, Brooklyn is really, it's not very well written and it's very angry. It's like, <laughs> like angry, it's funny and angry and critical. Like, and I get criticized a lot for that. The new book's a lot different because it was written after many years in Asia and just a different, different yeah. perspective, but I mean, it's so critical, which is why I liked your fight commentary. Back then. Yeah, because I, I used to be, I used to take that angry approach too. Sometimes, you know, I'd be yeah. like, Oh, look at this guy. You know, you teach BS. I used to be like that. And then yeah. I think, you know, we all go through that process, right? Because for me, um, just to tell viewers a little bit, I don't think I've ever talked about my experience in China. I mean, I did, but the one thing I never gave credit to was that I had some good classmates. I was the only American kid in my school, but I never got bullied. It's amazing. Right. If anything, I was angry and I fought my classmates a lot, but they were rarely the ones to initiate it. You know, I would kind of, I would create a situation where then I would have to fight them. But, you know, credit goes to my classmates. I only got jumped once and that wasn't because I was the American kid. It was because I made the the Star Trek kid jealous. So like I never got singled out. I actually that's not true. I got singled out, but in like a celebrity way for being the American right, kid. Right, right, right. Which exactly. is why I tell people, I tell all my audience, like there's I could step away from this anytime. Like fame is so empty. So like I, I don't I've been there. I've been there since I was a kid. You know, I don't like being the celebrity. It leads to a lot of pressure, you know. They would expect me to be more athletic because I was American. And I was like, can you just give me a break? I don't want to be more athletic, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. But, um, you know, I trained Kung Fu in Chicago. Um, Feng Lao Shi, very good, very good coach. My Kung Fu training in China wasn't that bad, honestly. You know, um, it was your standard Shou Nian Gong. So, you know, it was the different styles. But, you know, they, they did a lot of conditioning. That's the difference. Like, we had a lot of body conditioning. Um, when I came to America is when the Kung Fu training really got bad. And I, a lot of my anger, a lot of people are like, why are you so angry? It's like, my anger isn't at Chinese culture, so to speak, or Chinese people or Kung Fu. It's at those three wasted years of Kung Fu in America where I got all these injuries and stuff like that. So I took a very long break. And then um, when my channel started, that's when I kind of got back into martial arts training. So I took a very long break, but it really gave me time to think whether I really want to train. And the answer is, of course, I want to train. So... Yeah, um, so that's a little bit where some of the anger and some of my early videos came from. But tell me more, Antonio, where did the anger come from for you? <laughs> I mean, it was, you know, when I lived in the temple the first time, okay, so 2003, I was in the temple the first time. 2013, Black Belt Magazine said to me, why don't you go back and do like a 10-year, you know, perspective? And I needed to get in shape because I get, got accepted to my PhD program. I needed to be in shape for the wrestling and Sanda at the university. I needed to pass the HSK. So I said, you know what I'll do? I'll go to Shaolin Temple. I'll arrange you know, Chinese lessons while I'm there. It's the only way to really be immersed in China. It's like so hard to be immersed in Chinese. Yeah. People think yeah. when you're living there, you're yeah. immersed, which is just nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Absolute nonsense. You, the average foreigner in China, unless you have a very specific job and situation, you have like three minutes a day exposure to Chinese language. And it's the same thing every day. It's like talking to the taxi or you know, ordering food. Yeah. So exactly. I go to Shiko. Yeah. So I went back to Shellman. It was so much better. But um, when I was there the first time, I lived in a house where there were 60 people, one uh, nigga, so nigga outhouse. There was like one outhouse right? A one whole outhouse. It was full. Okay. It was completely full. It was overflowing. Ooh. So they said to us, so they said to us, don't use it. Use the, use, just go outside. No, yeah. no, no. 
no, 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 no. What? Don't use it. Full stop. And I'm like, okay, well, where's plan B? Yeah. Right. And this was everything. And all the way until like when I left China in 2019, when I finally just got fed up and left China, but it was just, just time and time again, where they would come to you and go, you know, um, you know, this isn't working and I'll go, okay, well, what's plan B. And there's just, there is no plan B. There's just nothing. You just, no, you just, just, just don't use the bathroom, you know, for the three months of your year, you know, and, and it, like stuff like that. And like, you get 60 people living in a house, there's no showers. So we'd go like once a week or once every two weeks to take a shower. And then, um, and then SARS started and then they closed all the shower places. And I go, well, what's plan B? Oh, there's no plan B. Okay. So we're just not going to bathe. It could, because there's a pandemic, you don't bathe because that's obviously how you, you know, deal with a pandemic, you know? And it was just, it was just on and on and on stuff like that it was just ridiculous. And, and like, so I got there and we had sparring and basically all the students just using boxing. That's the other thing. Cause growing up, my teacher, H David Collins, fire and water system of Kung Fu in Tennessee, he told us boxing is like essentially the baddest martial art on the planet, you know? And back then we used to, we used to fight like Taekwondo guys, karate guys, whatever. And we'd always win on our boxing. And now I will say my teammates in, in America and Tennessee, they could all kick better than me. So my kicking was never good. But one reason why my kicking was never good, because I never saw the point. I was like, well, you, you know, all your knockouts come from boxing. All these guys, once you cross that middle distance, once you get within one meter, it's boxing range. There was no wrestling back then. So once you were one meter, you were, you were safe. I mean, you couldn't even get hit and you're just punching this guy. And then what are they going to do? Throw their Taekwondo or reverse punch, you know, Kia, whatever, like, like let them, you know, in fact, I'll give you a freebie, you know, cause it's nothing. And, um, so that's how I grew up. So I get to Shaolin and I was sparring these guys and Sanda sparring and okay, I couldn't beat all the instructors, but I could beat like the students. I'd never been punched in the face by a boxer, you know? And um, so that was kind of my first, uh, actually in Taiwan, I guess it started, but that was kind of kind of my first, like the, 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 the myth beginning to just unravel, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and I would, I would beat those guys. And then, Later, they'd bring me to the monk and I'd have like an audience with the monk. And then he would say to me, and he would always say, he's like, and Shaolin Kung Fu is the most powerful martial art in the world. That's why no one from outside has ever come here and beat one of our people. <laughs> and I'm you're like, like, I've been beating your people? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, other than this afternoon. Yeah. You know, and, and they really believed stuff like that. And I remember like, just all these insane beliefs they had about martial art, but it was because they hadn't been exposed to anything. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. You know, and they really believed that, like, you know, doing the, you know, Wubu Chuan or whatever they were doing, that, like, they were going to be able to, like, beat people in a fight. When I went back in 2013, they were, oh, the other funny thing, though, even in 2003, so all Wushu students learn some Sanda. Yes. Learn a little bit. Yeah. But there are people that are in the Sanda track. Yes. And they basically learn Wushu at the beginning, and then after that, they do, you know, 80, 90% of yeah. Sanda. Yeah. Okay. Guess what they, every school, I haven't been to every school in China, but every school I've been to, guess what they do? Bunkai. Yeah. When you have sparring day, Sanda students spar with Sanda students, Wushu students spar with, and they never fight each other. And in fact, I've even been in competitions where they had two categories. Wow. They actually had a separate competition for the Wushu students because the Sanda students would absolutely destroy them. Of course. You know, even at the at the sports institute at Shanghai University of Sport, like we had Sanda, I, I entered one competition in the uh, university and because they wouldn't let foreigners fight, which is another really common thing in China. It's really <laughs> hard to let foreigners fight or participate. So I, Zhang, Zhang Laoshi, who was in charge of Sanda, was, he really liked me and I really liked him. And he taught the PhD, all PhD students had to take Sanda Gudo class. And he was the teacher for that. And so he really liked me. And of course, in that class, I was like, you know, way ahead of like all the other, like, you know, <laughs> all these academics, you know, <laughs> you're holding my glasses while I do this kick badly. And, um, and uh, so he really liked me. And so he invited me to all his classes. So when they had the competition, he allowed me to fight. But when I was signing up, they go pro or amateur division. And I go amateur. And I go, I, I'm a student from the Wushu department. I get to fight in the amateur division. 
And uh, he comes flying over. He's like, no. <laughs> I go, why? I go, I'm not a Sanda guy. You know, I'm an MMA guy. I've had, I've had some Sanda, but yeah, that's not fair. Yeah. He's like, no, you have to fight in the pro. And I mean, he was right and he was wrong. Obviously, they put me in the Wushu division. I would have just, I can't imagine anybody could have could really beat me. But obviously, then they put me in the pro division. Then what do they do? They put me with like the biggest, strongest, toughest heavyweight who's got like 200 fights mm. and he's 20 years old and he's still fighting, you know, and they put me in with him and the bell rang. And I immediately just like grabbed his head. Cause they, they, most of Asia, they can't tie clinch, you know, Thailand, Cambodia, they, they, they know the tie clinch really well. And they train there, use it. But even here in Mongolia, I'm able to control guys with tie clinch that wow. I can't beat wrestling, but I can control them to the tie clinch. And um, so I just tie clinched him. And then I was like about to hit him. And then I thought, I don't know what the rules are. I suspect you're not allowed to hold the guy like in a tight clinch and like punch yeah. him. And I thought that's not nice. And I didn't want to do it. So I didn't. So I let it go. And then of course I had nothing else. Right. Cause he can, you know, he could avoid all my kicks, block them, whatever. And then kick me really, really, really bloody hard. Like to the mm. point that I can't stand up. And, and so, yeah, I just got like, absolutely. That, that's really the worst beating I've ever taken in a competition fight in my life. And uh, I went back <laughs> back to the dorm and I'm like laying on the bed and I'm sending out WeChat messages. I'm like, the, the, the birds are circling. <laughs> You're waiting to feast on my death flesh. <laughs> I'll be dying soon. You can have my Captain America action figures. <laughs> wow. Man, look at that. Avengers mug right there. <laughs> Always. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wow, that's so interesting because um, I went back to China in 2019 to talk to my uh, one, two of my old Kung Fu coaches. And that's what they told me, dude. They're like, yeah, dude, um, you know, we know all about the Xu Xiaodong stuff. And here's the thing. If you stayed in China, um, we would have had you do Sanda. So it would have been exactly like you said. They probably would have put me in the Wushu track because, you know, I was definitely more of a dance guy than a, than a Sanda guy. But um, they, like you said, I would have trained Sanda, right? Just to know a little bit of the applications. Right, right. So that seems like a standard thing that people also don't yeah. know about Kung Fu training in China, you know, is that if you're training at legit places, they will put you, they will have you spar. Of course, it's like usually like three or four years after you, you're training in Wushu yes, before yes. you start sparring. But it's better than nothing. I just, you know, I was only in China for about two and a half years. So... I didn't get to get to the point where I'm sparring. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so like in, in the sports university, right? So so you get to the sports university and it's insane because 7,000 students, about 40, so I, I'm not sure exactly, between 40 and 60% of them are Wushu majors. And then the rest are studying whatever Olympic sports, you know, and coaching and stuff for Olympic sports. But, you know, 40 to 60% of them are in the Wushu Institute inside of wushu taolu is the biggest thing and then um tai chi and then there were very few people that were like actual qigong majors but there was like a lot of overlap between people doing qigong and people doing tai chi you know they sort of went together weren't too many people that like just did qigong but and then there's sanda and sanda was like the orphan sport of the wushu institute yeah. although it's huge right but there's always this thing that they don't respect sanda because of course of course brain damage side. oh my god they weren't talented yeah. enough to do tai chi or wushu right yep. that's how it was in the 90s the people be like jay your wushu is so good man if i ever were to do it i could only do sanda that was the that was the thing yes. people would self-deprecate and talk about those like yeah dude i have to go down the sanda track both times I was in Shaolin, that's actually what they did, though. They, there would be kids. So everybody started with Wushu, and then somewhere along the way, they go, oh, this kid's terrible. We'll put him in Sanda. Yeah. Yeah. But at Shaolin, so so then I'm at the Sports Institute. Now, to even qualify, these guys are all state level, you know, uh, provincial level, whatever, international level. I mean, these are like all champions, right, of, of, at some level, everybody. And when I talked to them, they all told me almost the same story, which was that they all did Wushu Taolu for two years when they were very young. And as a result, like my, my, my best friend and training mate, Leo Shin, this guy was like over six feet tall. I, I, I was always thinking about Michael Phelps. He was like over six feet tall, had like freakishly long arms and legs, like John, John Bones Jones or something. Like his feet were the size of, you know, flippers. Wow. And 
he was 80 kilograms, everything was proportioned, strong. And because he did the two years of Talu before he ever did Sanda, he could do backflips, somersaults, you know, and all, you know. And then you get a guy like that, you put him in a, in a Sanda fight. My, I mean, he was, he was just, just an incredible fighter. But that was the idea that they put these kids in Talu for like two years. Yeah. They have this flexibility, you know, they could hold the kick over their head. I mean, all those things, you know. Yeah. Whereas in other countries, Sunda fighters will generally be fighters yeah. and they're not going to have all those skills. Yeah. Yeah, you know? exactly. Wow. Yeah. So, and, uh, so yeah, so that was interesting that, yeah, that, that pattern of like two years, the best Sunda fighters that I knew, all of them had kind of that two, two years, but when they were very young, like two years of, of Wushu yeah. and then, and then they became really good Sunda fighters. Interestingly, yeah. none of them were cross-trained in wrestling. And that's where like Kung Lee, I think was, was, uh, was special. You yeah. know, because Kung Lee was an American um, high school and I believe collegiate wrestler as well. Yeah, and he integrated his wrestling very well into his Sanda fights. That's why he was yeah. undefeated. Completely undefeated. Yeah. Even in China, he even fought in China. Um, I've seen yeah. one of those fights where he was fighting this really tough looking dude, but the dude had nothing on Kung, man. Right. Kung kept doing right. the scissor takedown on the guy. Right. And, 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 and nothing, and, and not to take anything away from Kong Lee, but he was a completely undefeated phenom in, in Sanda, but in MMA, he was, I mean, he was, I mean, he, I think he was a strike force champion, but you know, his MMA record isn't great. You know, he wasn't like, and, and, and I kind of use that as an example too, when people tell me like, you know, could we take, they don't do this anymore because I think the world knows better, but they used to ask me like 10 years ago, well, you think we could take a bunch of guys from Thailand who had like 250 Muay Thai fights, teach them to wrestle and they'll be MMA champions. I'm like, no, <laughs> yeah. no, it's two different yeah. things, you know? And, yeah. and even, and even Kong Lee, right? Even Kong Lee with a wrestling background and he's still good at Sundial, which Sundial is like so close to MMA. He's like yeah. 70% of the way there, you yeah. know? And yet, I mean, and he's very good and I'm sure he could beat me up, but you know, in the grand scheme of things, and he never became a UFC champion. His, his records are a bit mixed. Yeah. And it just shows you, you, you could be phenomenal in some other sport. Yeah, yeah. Know, and and not, not um, I interviewed Kung Lee in 2018. And one of the things he told me about the first Scott Smith fight, the first one where he lost, was that he only had a week to prepare because he was doing his Hollywood thing. He was being in movies. And then um, um, Scott Coker calls, calls him up for fun. And then he's like, yeah, I got a thing in a week. I need you to be the guy. So um, yeah. at least in defense of that first Scott Smith fight, Kung Lee was just unprepared. And I think Kung Lee's talked about it in other interviews too. His first Scott yeah. Smith fight, he was not, he was just unprepared. That's why his timing was off. And um, he slipped and Scott caught him with something. And that's why the second fight with Scott, you know, Kung Lee did very well. But like you said, um, your your point still stays that, you know, Kung Lee could be amazing at Sanda. You know, his wrestling's good. But the once you enter the MMA realm, Man, there's just so much variety. Some guy could just be better at one thing in all the yep. sports that comprise MMA, and suddenly you got nothing, and you you don't know what to do against them, right? Yep. Yeah, and and very interestingly, so and this is my own bias about wrestling, but the only sport where people have consistently just walked in with no other training, and one is wrestling. Mm -hmm. So there are so many examples, Randy Couture, you know, had like 10 days notice and, and no, you know, he had like one MMA session before he walked in, you know, like there's so many where Ben Askren never, I mean, you saw Ben Askren box last yeah. month. Yeah. That's after like, years of being a professional fighter. That was the level of his boxing. Yeah. Like, Worse than Jake you know, yeah. it's the only sport that's like that though. They, yeah. they, they walk in with nothing. I mean, jujitsu is probably close, but still no cigar because there's a lot of really good, like Lucky Machado, got destroyed in uh, Dare FC by a DJ, an American DJ in his 30s, like doesn't train, doesn't exercise, stays up all night. I would assume living the DJ style, you know, live. I mean, beat the daylights at Aleki Machado because all that he had was take him down and do submissions. And the guy just kept punching Lecky in the face. Wow. Yeah, well, I, I, you, please send me that um in the future i've never seen this one before please send me a, a later i'll add you on facebook okay yeah i can't remember that the american dj's name is something like ludicrous or something like that i can't <laughs> remember his name 
what his name was, but yeah, uh, I'll, I'll see if I can find that. I'll send it to you. But, um, oh, you know, on one of the, I, I don't think it was yours. So I'm not going to say the name. I'm not shouting out to any other fight commentary people, but <laughs> somebody had a fight commentary video. It was something like 10 times where, you know, traditional martial artists got destroyed. And what, what of the fights was my teammate? What? Chen Man Kong. Yeah. So when I was in Malaysia, when I was in Malaysia, right. So, so I fought in that tournament. And I came out of the cage and there was, and I'd been studying under a, um, an Islamic guru in Malaysia. I'd been studying Silat Kalam, right? So he brought a dato with him. A dato is like a titled lord in Malaysia. He brought him with him to watch me fight. I got out of the cage and dato said to me, oh, I really enjoyed seeing you fight. He goes, do you have plans? I go, I go dude, I'm the Brooklyn monk. There is not, <laughs> if you believe any of this is planned. And he's like, well, would you like to come live with my family? And like, you could be my personal trainer and my bodyguard. And when we go to Cambodia to do business, you'll translate for me and be my bodyguard. And uh, you could just train here in Malaysia and fight. And I said, okay. And I literally, like we went to the hotel, picked up my bag and went to his house. And that was like, right. So one of the uh, things that happened at that tournament was a coach came to me and he said, do you want to join my, my MMA team? I said, okay. So he was the street fight Wing Chun MMA team in Malaysia. And he was a wow. Wing Chun guy. And so I went and trained with them. So I lived with the Dato and then the driver took me every day to the MMA. And um, when I first got there, there's a video online of me trying to learn to do the, the thing. And, and I'm looking at that and I said to him, I go, you know, I didn't say even if this works, because I know it doesn't, but I don't want to insult him. I said, but you know, the reason this works <laughs> For you is because you've done it for 30 years. I don't think I can learn it in like six weeks and then fight again. You know, whatever, we're fighting again in six weeks. I, go, I don't think I can learn this, you know, and, and fight again. And then I also like, and I had to be like really diplomatic. I'm like, you know, and I have a really extensive boxing and the you know, Muay Thai background. I go, maybe I should do that. And for these other boys, this is good because they don't have anything. And so they're you know, starting from a clean slate. Your cup is half empty or whatever. <laughs> And uh, so he said, okay, so he didn't make me do the Wing Chun, but my teammates had to do it. So my teammate gets in the cage and he's got his hands out in that, you know, that Wing Chun thing. His name is Chan Man Kong. And, um, and he fought Lecky Machado. And it was right after Lecky had lost to that American guy. So Lecky doesn't want to lose, right? So he, he broke my friend's arm. Ooh, I think and I've seen that coach, one. I, he and started the out in the so center. They moved him back, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes, oh, that's so the one. that's, that's your the teammate. One. What? That's the one. That's the one. And the referee referee says to him, I think, I'm trying to remember who the referee was because I knew the referee too, but because I fought I fought on that card. Wow. I fought on that same card. Yeah. I fought on that that same night. And um, his hand was like over the line. They're like, no, he has me behind the line. And then finally the referee's like, put those hands down. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, I fought on the same card and, and I won my fight. I think it was the that was the night that I fought Red Shaw. And okay. um and then so then the fight, what do you call it? Like the fight records, the stats for the gyms got published, right? Uh-huh. So that gym had all these wins. 80% of them were mine. Wow. 80% of the wins of that gym were mine. And that's when I went, okay, if I stay at this gym, I don't think I'm gonna learn anything. Yeah. So I just got to and plus Chen Man Kong, he was he was my good friend. I mean, I enjoyed training with him. He didn't know anything though, but I could still kind of train with him, but now he had a broken arm. So I'm like, okay, so now I don't even have that. Like, wow. who am I going to train with? Some 65 kilogram guy, you know, that may, or, you know, with, with questionable skills. So um, we shot a pilot for a TV show. It was going to do, we we're trying to do like the ultimate fighter in Malaysia. Uh -huh. And we had the selection day where all these fighters came and they competed for a spot. And I was the coach and, we're gonna, you know, pick out the best fighters to, to go on the TV show. So one of those fighters, it turned out, owned a gym in Johor Bahru, Malaysia, and they had been running MMA fights for like for years. No one knew about them. They didn't have any press. So I get down. So he invites me to go live there, and that's how I wanted living in the academy. They had their own fights every month. He had guys with like at a time when there were no the only professional MMA promotion in Asia. Well, let's say outside of China and Japan, the only one that was going was Dare FC in Thailand. And they only had like three or four events. And then I get to Johor Bahru and I find out there's this thing called Ultimate Beatdown. And they and they were having events every month. He had guys with like, you know, 12, 15 fights. 
at a time with nobody else in Asia and any at zero, you know, everybody at zero. And um, yeah, so I wound up living down there and that's how I was able to fight all the time. But at yeah, Tanaman Kong. <laughs> wow. Uh, for those of you wondering what I'm doing, I'm literally writing all this down. Like uh, um, Antonio's dropping all these knowledge bombs on us. It's awesome because one of the first videos I ever covered on Fight Commentary Breakdowns, this is very old. And I'm, I'm looking at the metadata. The metadata is probably not even correct. So I need to correct it. But yeah, it was a, it was, I found that match and I like did a little commentary over it. It's crazy. Like it. I was Maybe like, it was your video then. Maybe it was you where I saw. Because I just saw it recently. I was cracking up somebody's <laughs> video. I'm like, oh my god, this show might come. And the other funny thing was, I went to New York, and yeah, because I was fighting in Malaysia. I went home for Christmas, and I was on um, Eddie Goldman's uh, 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 No Holds Barred. And Eddie said to me, he goes, yeah, you know, you know, we want to talk to you about this guy who got his arm broken. <laughs> apparently everybody knew about it like around the world and and it was like it was like what the hell is going on in malaysia yeah. so there were two things happened right around the same time so chan man kong got his arm broken and the other one was there was a fighter two of my friends that they were promoting as they were going to be the new thing one of them was raymond the rocket too and um the raymond was like really good looking he was a sanda champion in malaysia he was, you know he's popular people liked him and they, they were trying to promote him as like the next thing in mma and um so we had a fight in in the early days of malaysia we had a fight in um in um nightclubs right mm -hmm. so we were in a nightclub fight and they announced over so raymond won his fight his scheduled fight and then they announced over the over the anybody from the crowd can get in and fight him and he fought like two other people. They just like stepped out of the crowd. Dude, he... Ungbok style, huh? Wow. Yeah. yeah, but he beat them easily. And then that even made the, pro like even in New York, they knew about it. They're like, what the hell's going on? You got this professional fighter fighting people like in a bar. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they were kind of upset about it. Wow. But, but he got into the, Raymond, like there's another example. Raymond was a Sanda champion, but in Malaysia. So I mean, he had very few fights compared to like, uh, Sanda champions in China, right? Mm -hmm. But he trained at, I believe, Beijing uh, Sports Institute for, I don't know, a year or something. I mean, like, he was good. His skills were good, but he never wanted to learn to ground fight, never wanted to learn to wrestle. And you could only go so far. And so yeah. in Malaysia, it was easy for him to win. I don't think he ever lost any fights in Malaysia, but then he got into one FC, you know, and he immediately lost. Oh, because, I like, see. Yeah. I'm looking yeah. at him right now as you're talking to Raymond the Rocket. Yeah. And he's my good friend, you know, and I'm not. Yeah, dude, he, he should him. stop fighting being movies, man. He's got like that movie face. He does. He does. Yeah, he um, he I think that's what he's doing, actually, because mm -hmm. he uh, I think he's back in Malaysia and he's doing doing movies and TV stuff. And yeah, yeah he doesn't fight, don't he? He because, you know, fighting. with my face, I can only play villains. Right. So he, he can play. <laughs> he can play the guy. I, I love playing villains. So, yeah, if you want me to play villain, I'll play villain. But, you know, he can play he can play the good guy. You know, it's great. I, I played the villain for many years, and now that I'm getting gray hair, I can play, like, the general. Ah. That's awesome. So, and Antonio, let's go even more in depth about kind of your disillusion with Chinese martial arts. So, you know, you saw that in Shaolin, you know, they trained some mediocre fighters, but you could be most of the students and stuff. What else did you test out? I mean, you know, we learned about your journey in the sports universities and stuff. And, you know, they they wouldn't let you fight amateur because you beat all the amateur. Right. What other things made you question sort of the efficacy of certain martial arts practices in China? Well, I mean, basically, look, look, Wushu Tao Lu, you know, uh, Tai Chuan Dao, you know, any of these things, it, karate. Uh, if you have a kid and you want to put them in martial art, I think these things are wonderful for children. I think it's great. And I came 180 degrees on that. I used to be really against it. I used to be really against belts and all that. Now I'm like, no, you know what? Let your kid go in Taekwondo. Let them earn that little belt and work because they learn to work towards goals and discipline and they'll have the flexibility. They'll have the high kicks and the average person doesn't need to fight. So it's fine and it's good. And I think those things are great. Ta Taekwondo, Wushu Tao Lu, Wushu Tao Lu. And, and the cool thing about Wushu Tao Lu is that when your parents have a barbecue and they go, show everybody your Kung Fu, you, know, you can do your thing, right? Whereas, you know, when, when my dad would say, hey, show them what you're learning. And you know, I'd like punch somebody, you know? <laughs> and uh, so I think it's good. 
but it's not fighting and, and you need to recognize that. And what I found after 2013 was that they knew that, you know, mm, or like, even when I got into the, the sports university, they generally, they all knew, there was no question at sports university, nobody at, the, at sports university was walking around thinking that they were Wushu Talu, that they were going to beat the Sundog guys or even the wrestlers or anything else. Yeah. Um, and when I went back to Shaolin Temple in 2013, they knew what MMA was. They were watching the fights on TV. I don't know why, but Anderson Silva just became like wildly popular in Asia at that time. And then later, um, Conor McGregor, like everybody knew Conor McGregor, Conor, Conor, Conor. <laughs> and um, McGregor, MC, oh, it's funny, my Vietnamese friends would call him MC Gregor, MC like, like Gregor. he was a rapper. Yeah, nice. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Connor could yeah. probably be a pretty popular rapper if he tried. He's got the talent. Do whatever he wants. Yeah. Because yeah. my students were all walking around because I was a principal at high school, you know, and I saw the kids doing this crazy zombie walk in the hallway. I'm like, what the hell is that? And then I was watching a Connor McGregor fight. And I realized it was his, it was the mm. Connor walk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Up. Yeah. You know, Antonio, it's funny you mentioned that fact that, you know, a lot of people after the 2010s, that's the timeline I give for people who ask me that too. I would say the majority of people with a brain in China after the 2010s knew that Kung Fu was not the most effective thing to train if you want to fight, right? So, um, and um, Ramsey Dewey, who who went to went to China probably um, in the, I don't remember when in the 2000s, but, you know, by the time I left China, that's when Taekwondo was starting to really blossom in China. Because again, it's like the Olympic because gold, the right? If you kick, so like, it, it was because of the Olympics. Like Taekwondo yeah. just took off. Yeah. Yeah. So like, I, I always tell viewers that, yeah, Ramsey Dewey, he's 100% right. You know, because he's talked about this before. Like Taekwondo is the most popular sport in China. Like martial arts, it's the most popular martial art in China, hands down. And Ramsey saw it literally blossom yes. because he was in China. I came to America, started training Bullshito Kung Fu, unfortunately. But, you know, like most people in China, if they were to, put their kids in something that's martial arts related it would be taekwondo would be my taekwondo, little cousin yeah. was in taekwondo he hated it but he got put in yeah. it for a month you know that's how it is it's oh, so it's oh, like even it's, when with, like like even my final stint in china i was living in a relatively small village mm -hmm. and there were like five taekwondo centers yeah exactly you know? exactly tiny little village and yeah. not even one like sanda boxing you know and there was like five taekwondo yeah centers. you get yeah. to maybe a tier three city and above in china um, yep. And you might get a Shao Nian Gong for Kung Fu, yep. but that's about it. Like below yep. tier threes, you're not going to get like. Um, yeah, this was a tier three. It was a tier three city. There was one Sanda school, but it was like only open on Saturdays. You know, it was very limited. There was one judo, judo slash Sanda as well. And it was like mm -hmm. only on Saturdays. Yeah. But yeah, Taekwondo, there was like numerous, you know, at yeah. least five. And then several of the schools. Yeah. had their own taekwondo program lots of schools have taekwondo program. my school did i, I hired a taekwondo teacher nice nice yeah. and uh, at least from what i tell viewers is that see because the majority of people with a brain in china knew that kung fu was not the most effective system this there was like no debate right it almost feel like the debate was actually more in the west you know and part of it was people like me bringing all these fights and then all these people who drank the kool-aid in the west were actually the ones arguing like most people in oh, china yeah. would would talk to me and i'm sure they would they would tell you the same they'd be like how can you guys make a career out of like disproving kung fu is not effective we all know it's not the most effective thing they're like they're like wonder how the west would get confused yeah. about that oh i know i know it, it amazes me how many people in like rural new jersey or ohio they've never been anywhere and they're telling me i'm wrong about china and chinese martial art and ramsey dewey we did this the podcast uh that we did together basically he kept me on this on, on the thing about shaolin temple that like we talked about that it was the whole day he's like can they fight i go no and like and he's apparently like quoted me like all over the internet and and he took he said that that one episode got more views than all of his other episodes and he you know and of course there's all these negative attacks and you know but it, it, it's the reality and it kills me that i don't know anyone who trained in china who then or trained significantly in china who then says to me you're wrong yeah right or who fought in China, like because Ramsey Dewey fought, you know, MMA, and of course he runs an MMA gym in, in Shanghai, and uh, and uh, there I have had people who studied at Wudang, mm. at the Wudang, which is basically you know a tourist temple, the other tourist temple, of course, which doesn't even have 
does not even have a tago, does not even have like a sanda component as far as I know. So it's like even worse than Shaolin because at least at Shaolin, there are guys who lived in Shaolin a long time and then they go. And then one day I saw the sanda training at Tago and I thought, you know, what the hell am I doing? Or any of those guys could beat me up, right? But you don't even have that if you're in Wudang. So those are the only people I've ever had that trained in China that criticized me, you know? But I've never had anybody that fought Never. I never, I always say, I, always go, I never had anybody that fought one more fight than me who criticizes me, published one more book than me who criticizes, you know, it's only some guy that's done nothing and he's certain I'm wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my, my cousins who don't even train martial arts, even they knew they're like, yeah, Jerry, everyone, everyone that, that are my peers knew that Kung Fu is not the most effective thing. Doesn't mean it's not cool. It's just not the most effective yeah. for fighting. So they're, yeah. they, they really were confused. They're like, Jerry, how do you make, how do you make a career out of like just showing this stuff? I'm like, you know, other people, you know, it's funny because we were talking about earlier how Chinese people a lot of times are in this really big bubble, right? But it's the yeah. same elsewhere. You know, there's certain people in America who've never really left their village either right yeah. all they have is limited set of what their tv and now what their internet shows them they don't know what the real world's like either i can't believe that i'm still having these arguments though i yeah. mean i can't believe that we're still i mean recently recently my facebook got suspended uh because a a, 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 a taekwondo master from us that's living in chiang mai and he's arguing with me about you know taekwondo can beat you know I'm like what what like, where are you and you live in you live in Chiang Mai. I didn't hear you say you had twenty seven fights, hmm. you know. And then uh, so I challenged him to an MMA fight. I go well, that would be the simple way to settle this. Let's let's organize an MMA fight. And then he reported me for bullying. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering because like just arguing is not enough. But I see. So he like oh my god, he's bullying me. He wants to fight me. Yeah. I see. Yeah, yeah. I'll add but, you on Facebook right now. It looks like your Facebook's back, so that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I just got one of those suspensions where I couldn't do anything, but my account was still there. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah, I just added you. But yeah, yeah. it's 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 unfortunate because I think um, this is a, definitely a, a good conversation topic to talk about. But context is important, right? If if you guys are arguing about martial arts and you're like, hey, let's go, let's go, just test each other. That's different than hey, I will beat you up because you're way, you know, that's different. Well, and the other thing is challenging someone to an MMA fight is very different than threatening. I don't yeah. see how that's threatening. It's yeah. not threatening, yeah. you know? And, um, you know, but anyway, yeah, I mean, like all these guys, all the years I've been doing this, right? All, you know, I got criticized a lot. I used to be a lot more of a public person than I am now. I mean, now, you know, I'm kind of like fading away a bit, which is fine. Um, as you said, you know, there's nothing wrong with not being yeah. famous yeah. too, right? It's fame is empty, man. The, the, the You realize like, all, at the end of the day, having like a few good friends is enough. <laughs> that, you know, yeah. The, yeah. Well, what I found out, what I found out was I used to not like the people who criticized me. And then when I, when I interacted with people that really liked me or they were fans or whatever, I found out I didn't like them either. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. <laughs> so I, 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 you know, and I hate to like sound awful, but a lot of these people, I was like, what, like, like, if I met you, there's no way I would hang out with you. <laughs> You're an yeah. idiot. You know, a lot of them were more. And, and, and like, what happens is if people agree with you, you don't know why they agree. Because, like, if somebody disagrees with you, you, you argue and you find out what their reasoning is. Yeah. When people agree with you, you don't argue. And then you find out, oh, my God, he agrees with me for, like, the dumbest reason. Yes. Yes. Like, he's yes. equally as wrong as the other guy, except that he's on my side. Yeah. I find that yeah. with politics. I find that with, you know. So, yeah, anyway, so, you know, I wound up that I was getting criticized a lot. And very often these guys, any anytime, anywhere, I'm like, all right, well, January 13th, you know, we're having a fight. Can I sign you up? Let me send you and send them the hold harmless waiver, mm -hmm. you, you know, to sign this and this. And none of these guys ever showed up to fight. Yeah. And once in Thailand, we were filming a TV show, Kill Armon, which is this um it's a Finnish TV show. He's a tailor and he flies around the world and he challenges the best martial artists to fight. So wow. They can beat him up. Wow. <laughs> and I was on two episodes of his show. We did one in Taiwan and one in Thailand together. And I organized his uh, Cambodia one. But anyways, we were in Thailand filming the Kill Arm on TV show. And mm -hmm. The guy showed up that wanted to challenge me. And it was exactly like that scene in the movie Dragon, the Bruce Lee story. Yeah, yeah. It was that scene, and I had to tell the camera man, "Go shut off the camera." Wow! <laughs> I want this guy, 
<laughs> and I beat him up and they turned the camera back on and we finished filming the scene. <laughs> But that's the only one, like in all these years, and all these people are challenging. And it's not that I'm such a tough guy, it's that they're not. I mean, it's a big deal. I'm not saying because I'm such a fierce fighter. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that the people who do these things are completely weaklings. And the people who could beat me would just never do that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know? Yeah, it's it's so interesting. You know, Will Chope. Um, Will Chope's like one of my best friends. He's had like 150 fights, you know. Mm-hmm. Will Chope's never going to yeah. challenge him. Yeah. And if he did, he would just destroy me, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, something I'll really add to what you talked about earlier. So my fight commentary audience is really good. Like so far I've only had to block, like it's, it's less than 20. I've only had to block like less than 20 people out of that many people that do contact me. Right. So, and I think part of why the fight commentary audience is really good is because, you know, my, my channels, I'm not claiming I'm some good fighter. I'm not claiming anything. So like we, we usually, most people have their egos in check. So that's already a good thing. And then we're usually, if you watch my channel, it's probably open-minded, right? So it's like open-minded right, people who right. have their egos in check. So that's why I get along really well with most of my fight commentary audience. But man, my other channel that I used to, I used to have where I was talking about controversial issues, talk about politics. I had the exact same experience you had. I would meet my fans and I'd want to hit them in the face. Like, uh, yeah, figuratively yeah. because it's like the exact you you took the words exactly out of my mouth that i wasn't able to express for like five years they would agree with me on like the stupidest shit it's like that's not the point of why right. we're on the same side yeah. why the fuck do you relate to me forgive my french on this right, right, stupid right, right. ass thing you know and, and well you know you don't you know and it tells you but but the good thing of, of that realization jerry it keeps you from hating people who disagree with you because yeah. you suddenly realize Actually, the majority of people, their opinions aren't based on very sound logic yeah. or reasoning. And, and it's on both sides, because it's very easy, particularly in, in politics. You go, the other party, those guys are wackadoos. Yeah. yeah. You know, but my party is smart. Yeah. And then when you start talking to people in your party, you go, actually, although they agree with me, they agree with me for like really dumb reasons that, yeah. that are not sustained by logic or, yeah. you know, yeah. Would stand up, yeah. Wow. That yeah. was so refreshing to hear you say that because I'm. I have 45,000 followers on that other channel and they're still like, they're still a very small sizable number that are always like, dude, we love you, Jerry. We we're encouraging you, but the majority of them, I would want them to just go away and nobody can right, right, right. like, I could never explain why. And it's because if I met the majority of them, I'd be like, this is a judgment on myself that I have these people watching me. <laughs> you know? It's like if, if, on the office, I have a couple of jokes that, that, I, mean, that I have with my publisher. And one of them is, um, he goes, why don't you do book signings anymore? I go, because I don't like the people who re- read my books. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, exactly. And, and the other one, the other one is the TV show, The Office. There's a, uh, Andy Bernard goes on a sales call with, uh, with Michael. Mm-hmm. And then Andy Bernard like totally insults the guy they're trying to sell the paper to. And so the guy kicks him out of their office and Andy Bernard goes, ah, do we even want a guy like that buying our paper? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and Michael goes, yes, <laughs> yes, we want everyone buying our paper. <laughs> Yeah. And, and that's why the people who really reach the top of fame, you see how they always have mental breakdowns. You see how they always turn to drugs and they're always empty. You know, usually if you find God, you're probably a little better, but you know, like it, it, there's a reason, right? Imagine well, like, like we're Joe, talking Joe about Rogan compounded. Interact. Joe Rogan uh, has a policy. He will not interact with anyone. So he has tons of followers on Twitter said he doesn't read the feeds and he doesn't interact with them. That's how he manages it. It's so basically Joe Rogan, right? Yes, I want them to buy my paper, you know, and I don't care who they are. And that's fine. And it's not for me to judge. I want them to buy my paper, you know, and so that's the only way you could do it. Because if you interact with people, you don't want them arguing and fighting. And yeah, the, the crazy thing about my, my, my martial arts odyssey, though, was especially in the first 10, 10, 11 years, right, until I started fighting pro MMA. And then people would write to me and they'd be like, oh, yeah, that master that you showed us, like, yeah, he's not real. I agree with everything you said, but there's this other master. There's this other style. And I would always pin them down. I go, well, where? Because I can actually go there. Unlike you, where it's like, um, I will go there. Mm-hmm. I am wrapping up things in wherever I was, BNTN, you know, you know, Kampong Chum, wherever I was. I'm wrapping this up tomorrow and then I'm, I'm, I'm free to go anywhere. Where is this other master? Well, you know, he's over the next hill. You know, he, 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 he's in the hidden valley. He's in the secret cave. Like, like, like 90% of the time, 
I would push and push, and it, basically this guy didn't exist that was better, right? Didn't exist. Because if he existed, he would have a location, wouldn't it? You could actually go there. And I, and I remember like people would say to me things like, oh yeah, well, you know, he talks about how, how a big boxer's punch can knock out these Kung Fu guys. We'll let him try that on uh, Oxbow Road in Beijing. So I went to Oxbow Road in Beijing. I don't know, it was like any other road in Beijing. There was, there was a haircutter, there was a restaurant. You know, I don't know that people on Oxbow Road in Beijing can take a punch better than people on any other road anywhere else, right? And this is part of the issue is that because these people didn't travel, like, like just recently, just recently, there was a guy that posted on one of my comments about Shaolin and he goes, the children and the young people in the Shaolin Temple are the best conditioned athletes in the world, full stop. And I go, really? Well, what about the um, several thousand sports schools in China? Are those guys not equally well conditioned? And, you know, and then they start ripping into me, you know, no, you're wrong. I'm like, no, actually, I'm not wrong. That's there's thousands of sports schools and Wu Xiao is Wu Xiao and Ti Xiao. And they're two separate things. And all and, and most of the Ti Xiao have, you know, Wu Xiao, you know, department or whatever, but there's separate Wu Xiao, you know, and it's like, but they're all over China. They're not just in the Shaolin Temple. Yeah. And, um, and um, to support what Antonio said, there's a reason why China gets so much gold, right? They have the T Xiao, okay? Literally put kids in there since they're kids to train up their bodies. You have to tell them. <laughs> they yeah, T Xiao, sports university. No, so no, no, they, no. T Xiao is a sports school. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. they put these kids in there since they're very young. Like, I'm sure people in the US, whatever they're watching, have probably read articles about, like, basically specialized institutions that train people for one thing to get Olympic yeah. gold, right? Yeah. Like that's a real thing. So like, so, you know, there's very legitimate places in China where it's like OCD level of training your body. Yeah. So, so my new book, my new book, uh, tech, right now it's called the Wushu doctor. I wanted to call it the wrestling doctor, but then I thought I already have a book called the wrestler's dissertation. So I'm going to the Wushu doctor. Cause technically I'm a doctor of Wushu. Uh, so the new book, The Wooster Doctor, I don't know if the publisher is going to keep that title. But anyway, I talk about all this because it's my experience at the sports university. And so like, okay, so you got the T-Shaw. So what happens is there are agents that work for these T-Shaw and they go out into the countryside and they come to the village and all the parents will bring their kids because you know everybody wants a better life for your kid right and they're like look if we pick your kid kid's going to go to school for free free food free clothing free medical they're going to learn sports they're going to make a gold medal in the olympics they're going to be a millionaire and you're going to live off that the rest of your life that's what they tell so they go in the village and they give the kids all these random sports tests because again contrary to what westerners who never left new jersey believe there are no sports in china there are as good as no sports in china there are several thousand T Shao and outside of the T Shao, there's like nothing like the average Chinese kid. First of all, the U S is the only country that has sports teams at school. The whole academic, uh, you know, what do we call it? Um, scholastic sports system in the U S it's the only country in the world that has that, you know, when you meet Brits and they tell you, Oh yes, yes. I did a bit of sport in school. I'm running the hundred. What they mean is once a year, their school had a track meet. And then he ran in that and maybe he won. You know, that's what they mean. They, they don't have scholastic sports on what we, like we have in the US. So the way they do it in China is you have these T-Shao, kids are selected at a very young age. They put them in a T-Shao, they don't go to school. They just learn one sport and they have, by law, they're supposed to have three hours a day of academics, but it's in a one room school. I mean, I, mean I, I, I write about this in the book. Like I went there, it was a one room school room. There were kids literally, listen to this, Jerry, seven years old and 20 years old sitting in the same classroom with one teacher and no books and that's yeah. their academic training yeah. right so then they do the sport all the way through t shell if they are good enough they can compete for a spot at sport university but there's only seven sport universities in china thousands of t shell seven sport universities and unless you go to beijing or i think xi'an it, depending upon your sport, it's very unlikely that you're going to go any further. Like that's pretty much it. You know, you'll, you'll compete at the scholastic level, you know, collegiate level, 
Uh, you probably do some international, but the odds of you going to the Olympics are pretty minimal. And, but anyway, the, the, in my book, I talk about like the agent comes to the village and he gives the kids sports tests. Well, the kids don't know any sports. So they have all these weird things. They, I mean, uh, weird. I mean, they're not weird because they're probably based on science, but you know, they make them like step over a broomstick and, you know, like, like, like different things to, you know, to test their, their natural agility. And also just a lot of measurements and it's not just height and weight, but like how long are your legs, how big are your feet? And also they measure the feet and hands. Cause then they, cause that gives you an indication of how tall and how big the kid will be. And then they bring the parents in, they measure them. Like Yao Ming is seven foot six. His father is six, seven. His mother is six, three. And they were both collegiate basketball or they were both basketball players. And um, so all my friends at the sports university were telling me about like when the agents came to their village and all of them said, I would say 90% of them said that the sport that they were picked for, they had never heard of. No one in the village knew what, like this one girl was telling me, yeah, no one in my village knew what fencing was. And wow. she got picked for fencing. And my martial arts friends, because mostly I was with them. So of course people had heard of martial arts, but you know, even like, like judo and stuff, like, like most of them weren't selected for judo, like the fat kids, they selected them for wrestling. So like my judo friend, who's now at UFC Performance Institute, um, he was selected for wrestling because he was fat. And then he did it for like two years, he hated it. And then he saw the judo team and he said, I want to do that. And he did judo and now he's at UFC. And, um, but yeah, they, they all have these stories like, and like my friend Leo Shin, I would have to believe that they just like measured him and like his arms, his legs, his hands, his feet, which is super, super natural. And the insane thing is he married a girl from the sports university and she's beautiful and she's gorgeous. And he's like, like incredibly handsome. And the two of them together look like a movie star couple. And now they've produced a baby, <laughs> you know, and this baby's going to be like, it's like a superhuman, like, like, like they're doing genetic, you know, because, and his girlfriend, uh, his wife, I haven't met her, but when I'm looking at the pictures, she's not that much shorter than him. Wow. He's like six feet something. And she's probably like five, eight, five, ten, you know? And so they produced this baby that God knows what kind of sports champion this baby is going to be. And at, that was another thing that in my generation of sports at the sport university, a lot of my friends were telling me that both not one, but both their parents were sports champions or coaches, you know, so we're already into like second generation of genetic selection. You know? Yeah. 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 And the other thing I have to emphasize with what Antonio said is besides all this, like on steroids, you know, figurative on steroids type of genetic breeding, the average Chinese person doesn't do any sports. They don't, they don't even yeah. work out or exercise or do anything. You know, Nothing. now, yes, there's a little bit more yoga, a little bit more, you know, of stuff in China. But man, the only type of exercise the majority of people in China would get would be like walking after dinner. San Bu, as we call it. Just walking yep. a little after dinner. That's all. Yep. So by whole, China is not a country that's a very athletically conscious country. Oh, I'm so country. sick of hearing that. I'm so sick of hearing, oh, in China, they're all healthy and they're doing... Uh, you know, 90% of our stereotypes about Asia are, are about Japan because it was the only thing we knew in the yeah. 70s and 80s. Japan was a big thing. Yeah. And I still get people telling me, oh, China, they must be very clean and everyone's polite and they eat really healthy food. I'm like, no, it's really filthy. Everybody's impolite and they eat the most unhealthy food. They eat the most life. tasty but unhealthy food, man. They eat the food that will all give them health problems compounded by the fact that they never exercise. So yeah. all of them become and like bloated and when they're old and have memory loss. Yes, it, it really like, that's something I always tell. Like I always show my neck exercises because I'm like, if I can get my relatives to do one thing, it's to get a strong neck so when they're older, they're not like all like this, you know? Right, 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 right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And like, and um, so like doctors have told me that I think it's 70 or 80% of men over 30 in China have early onset cirrhosis and early onset, I think it's like fatty liver or something. Because you know, of the drinking. Business dinners. Yeah. The, business, the dinners. business dinners. You have to drink a lot and it's really and bad eat. quality alcohol. And eat and eat though, yeah. the food too. Because I don't drink alcohol at all. And the first couple of business dinners I went to, I tried to eat. I'm like, this is ridiculous. I'm in pain. Why, why are you doing this? Stop yeah. eating. Yeah. That's actually the chapter I'm writing right now. In my book. Stop eating. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm full now. <laughs> yeah. It's literally like these businesses, you go to these restaurants, they pump the food full of MSG and all this stuff. Yeah. 
And it's just well, like, you're like, oh, I can feel it's good going down, but oh, I, I just know what, what I'm putting in my body. Ugh. Yeah, it was horrible. Yeah, but anyway, like that's the average Chinese person. And I'm so sick of hearing, you know, like self-loathing Westerners or self-critical Americans and, oh, in China, they know that and the old people are so active. I'm like, you know, I, I've done a paper on this. I went in the US, I Googled like senior citizen skydiving. <laughs> it's like do it right now like like tons of stuff comes up because there's like crazy like senior citizen you know rock climbing like yeah. like all this stuff yeah. you could do like my dad was bodybuilding he was 75 i got a picture of me and my dad posing when wow. my dad is 75 wow you know and that's what america is and then in china that is not what's it's happening it's not it myth. Is myth it is a myth in fact in china there's rules that you can't participate in professional sport beyond a certain age mm. and, I, and I would inevitably wind up getting some kind of you know they'd let me because they knew me which is also a thing in China right mm -hmm. but you officially you couldn't and I knew lots of people that signed up paid for a fight paid for a competition showed up oh no I'm sorry you're over whatever it is 28 or something you're not allowed to compete yeah you know yeah so, the, a lot of these age restrictions man yeah man they're ridiculous yeah, you know ridiculous. if you're well enough and if you're willing to go and you can pass a medical why not why do you care how old yeah. the person is right yeah. especially because you're probably going to win yeah. yeah yeah but uh but yeah i hate i hate the self-loathing westerners i hate this this misconception the chinese are all healthy and this and that i hate the misconception. i've done several i've published a paper published several papers on chinese education system compared to the u.s it is not better it is dramatically worse uh, the PISA scores are taken from the best school in Shanghai compared to the average school in the United States. That's what the PISA is showing you. The best school in Shanghai compared to the average school in the United States. That is not a fair comparison. I mean, you still have hundreds of thousands of one-room schoolhouses in China where you've got kids, you know, like I said, from seven to 20 years old sitting in the same classroom with one teacher and no books. Oh, really? That's better? Like, I don't and care where you went to high school. Even the most elite schools, you know, they're just teaching you to pass that college entrance exam called the Gokul. Some yeah. of my audience would know that. They're, so, yes, you're better at getting a score, a bunch of scores yeah. on an exam. Doesn't mean they, they know anything about creativity or entrepreneurship or anything. Or, or, or thinking or applying what they yeah. what they've learned. Yeah. yeah. I know, I mean, I mean, I, I've been in... I, like I've literally been in rooms full of my Chinese colleagues where my jaw dropped open that they couldn't do something like it's 60 kilometers away. And if we drive 60 kilometers an hour, how long will it take us to get there? <laughs> and like, they, they can't figure it out. I'm like, are you serious? But meanwhile, if you gave them an equation already written out, like something really hard from, you know, calculus three or whatever, like they could do that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because they're not dumb. I mean, it's just a different kind of skill. But, but you know, you no, know, they did not have like problem solving ability like that. And, yeah, exactly. Because the education and oh, and you mentioned the Gao Cao. I don't know. I don't know how much Jerry you, you've done with the sports, you know, research in China. But you know, there's a sports Gao Cao. I did not know that. Wow. So there's a sports Gao Cao. So the kids that come out of the Ti Shao or the Wu Shao. So Wu Shao for the audience is so Shao means Shao Shui, which means school, right? And then nigga, or rather like elementary school or Shui Shao is school. But then the Wu Shao is like the Kung Fu school. So the kids, it's like a boarding school. And then the Ti Shao is like the sports boarding school. But anyway, so the kids who come out of that take a sport, if they want to go to university, they take the sport Gao Cao. Mm -hmm. And it only has, I believe, three subjects. It's um, math, English, and culture. The mm. Wen Huaku, but like Wen Huaku basically is like, yeah, communist indoctrination and like the glorious history of, of China, right? But I think it's just those three. And, uh, but it's really interesting that English is one of the requirements yeah. at a very low level. And then you have to get so many points to get, it, to, get to university. But if you've won a national title, you get points added. Oh, of course. So there are people that, so it's some metric of the two, right? So like there was a kid at, oh, and then there's another thing a lot of people don't know about. So the sports universities have a high school program where outstanding high school athletes move to the sport university, live in the dorms, train full time, and they're not guaranteed admission to the university when they turn 18. 
So they still have to take the sport gal cow and test in and everything. But there was a kid, can't remember his name right now, but there was this kid at Shanghai University of Sport. He was a Sandow fighter. And I watched it because I was there for three years. You know, as I watched him go from like 14 to 17 years old, he had won so many international titles that when he took the sport gal cow, he just had to sign his name. Yeah, yeah. And he was guaranteed admission. And I had other friends that like, they were really good, you know, in sports, but they're, they're, when Hua could, like they're, because they were also referred to just like their academic level as like Tom and Wen Hua could, you know, and, um, or Kuchi, but to be like Wen Hua, they would still use the word culture rather than academic. Like that's how they describe somebody's academic level. Of course. And there were friends of mine that like their academic level was too low. And even though they were champion and then the metrics, you know, didn't, didn't come out high enough. But, um, yeah, that's most people don't know about that. And that's kind of one of the reasons why I'm writing this book. Yeah. Yeah. Even the standard Gaokao, so not the stuff for the sports, but just the standard Gaokao. If you have certain things, like if you're very athletic, they'll add some points to you. Yeah, it's, it's so funny. It's like, it's it's not a completely fair system. Yeah. But, you know, was, the, the U.S. Oh, is the oh, same. Also different standards if you're rural, rural or a city. Oh, that's a big one. Or if you're yeah. one of the minority groups, you get a lot of points added to you. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yesterday, I needed uh, data on height and weight. And um, the urban height in China for men is eight centimeters taller than the rural height. Oh, yeah, totally. That's insane. Yeah. As an economist, one of the things we look at, obviously, you know that the cities are going to be richer than the rural areas. But the disparity between the development of the city and the rural area is actually an economic indicator. And obviously, the bigger that disparity is, it means the less developed that country is. Ooh. So even though Shanghai looks like the Jetsons, the fact that you've got people with outhouses and they can't read and, you know, whatever, and six fingers, like in the countryside, it means that your country really is not developed. And like in the U.S., like I lived in New York City and then we moved to rural Tennessee. Now, my city in rural Tennessee has, you know, three or four universities within a reasonable driving distance. we got a community college. We have, um, you know, it's probably like three MMA gyms. There's four really, four hospitals. Two of them are good. Two of them will cut your leg off. But, you know, the point is like, you know, in a city of 20,000 people and where the, 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 the surrounding cities combined comes to less than 100,000 people and you had all of that. And you don't have that in China. Like I was going to do a paper comparing my city to a Chinese city of the same size that was the same distance from a major city. Because we're mm -hmm. like the closest major city to where I grew up is Nashville, which is mm -hmm. six hours away. Mm -hmm. So I mean, we're really far even from any other city, you know, and yet we had all that. And you don't have that. Um, and plus, we didn't have dirt roads. I mean, you know, highways, and, you know, everything was normal, electricity. You know, Wi-Fi, cable TV. You know, by the time I was in high school, we had all that stuff. So, uh, you know, when you compare that to China, that's not the case. You know, and if you could even find a hundred thousand person city that was six hours from the nearest million person city, which I don't even know if you could find that in China, but it would be, you know, unlivable. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, um, I think a good final topic. Antonio is what's your plan now? You're in Mongolia. What are you going to do yeah. next? So I want to fight again. Um, I really want to fight again. I kind of don't want to fight a Mongolian because I just really like it here. And I like, you know, I, like I want to represent Mongolia and just go back to Malaysia and like walk in with my Mongolian, you know, the who, I don't know if you know the who. Yes. Mongolian. Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 yeah. <laughs> I love listening to them. They had a song called Uwe 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 or something. Uwe, that's, yeah, that's Uwe, 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 you know. Well, you know what that's about though? That's about that's about how the young people have lost their way. The young people have forgotten the glory of Genghis Khan and 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 the pride of of their nation and instead they're adopting all this foreign, you know, culture that's that's rather vapid, you know, and even like Ooh. they're even self-loathing in a way because they're not modern enough. Wow. And, yeah, and that's what Uva U is about. Yuba Yu means what's going on, but 
Hmm. You know, it's basically what he's saying. He's like, I talk to young people. They don't even know who Genghis Khan is. What's going on? You know, wow. I talk to young people and they're doing all these, you know, things that, you know, and, and, and they hate themselves. They, they, they don't even love themselves for being Mongolian. Mm -hmm. Anyway, though, so I do want to fight again. Um, I, I'm friends with the promotion here. They said that I could fight here uh, when I'm ready. So I might take them up on that, depending upon the COVID situation. I lost um, during the lockdown. I, I, I uh, permanently changed my diet. I lost 30 pounds. Then I doubled my workouts. So now I'm in really good shape and um, started sparring three weeks ago when the gym's open. So now I'm sparring. But, you know, I still got a long way to go, particularly if I'm going to fight in, in Mongolia because they're really good, you know. But, um, but uh, yeah, I do want to fight again. I'm in Mongolia. I'm writing, I'm writing this book right now about the sports university. Um, my long-term project here is that I'm writing a book about Mongolian uh, uh, culture, the uh, Nega wrestling culture. And I submitted that as a PhD dissertation thesis to the university here. So, um, so that's what I'm doing here, just writing my two books and uh, thinking about fighting. And I teach economics at the university. Cool. Well, it sounds like you're staying put in Asia for a while. Yeah, and especially with the COVID thing now, I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, if they kick me out of Mongolia, which could happen, then I would go back to the States because it looks like it's too dicey to try and go anywhere else. Yeah. Because yeah. you could land a job. Like when 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 the they announced here, when they were closing the airport in January of 2020, they announced it. And I started panicking. And they go, look, you got like a week to get out of the country. And if you stay, it's fine. But you're stuck. You can't leave. So I, I wrote to a company in Malaysia. I go, listen, you know, can I come work for you? And they were like, they weren't sure. And this, that. and then like three days later, Malaysia went under lockdown. And I'm like, wow, had I taken that job and moved, like I would not have had a job. And Malaysia uh, made it really hard for foreigners to stay or they kicked them out. Vietnam actually kicked all the foreigners out, like canceled their visas. So, it, you know, whatever happens, Mongolia hasn't kicked me out. If they if they tell me I have to leave the U.S., I'm probably going to go to the U.S. just because it just seems too dicey to go anywhere else. Yeah, but yeah, it but seems like if you're teaching in the university, should be fine. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I like my job here and, and now the University of Economics, which is the premier university here, they asked me to be a PhD advisor for the you know, grad, you know, PhD students. So I'm really excited about that. I mean, because one of my goals was to add something to Mongolia, you know, to, to bring something, yeah. you know, and if I can help with PhD research, that's wonderful. And, and if I can get this book published about wrestling culture, Mongolian wrestling culture so many young people don't know and, and that's why i love the who you know and i hope i get to meet them at some time and tell them that but you know that's why i love them because the, the young people don't know my students don't know yeah you know, my students said to me they go teacher why are you writing a book on that none of us care about that i said that's exactly why i'm writing a book on mm. that wow you know? and one last thing i'll ask from my end um that dish soap you have in the background Chinese people use that dish soap too. It's pretty funny. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's it's a very popular brand in Asia now that I know that Mongolians use it too. Yeah, well, eighty percent of our products are from China. So. Oh, that makes sense now. Yeah, actually, does it have Chinese writing? Oh no, uh, no, it's all written in English. Yeah, it's all written in English, but it's it's um all my all my relatives Russia. in China use it. Yeah. Yeah, but it's so funny. A lot of the products have Chinese writing on them. It's crazy when you go grocery shopping. Here. I love it. It's like German writing, Russian writing. Oh, the Russian one is funny because we write with Cyrillic here. So sometimes I'll start trying to read the product name and I'm like, those words say nothing. And then I'm like, oh, it must be Russian. <laughs> mm. Wow. Wow. Okay, dude. Antonio, I think this was an awesome talk. Let's do another one soon, sure, especially sure. once you figure out if you're gonna um, start fighting again soon. So yeah, let's let's do another yeah, talk. Yeah, and soon. we got Nadam, you know, and we got Nadam coming up, so so we can oh. talk about that next time. That okay. that's the it's arguably the world's largest uh, sporting event because mm -hmm. it's like millions of wrestlers will compete in Nadam, you know. So that's coming up in a couple of weeks. And uh, now that the airports are open, the MMA fights are happening again. One of my Mongolians just fought uh, for a title in Bellator. And um, so that's all coming up again. Wow. So yeah, so there's a lot to talk about, you know, in a few weeks if you want to. Cool. And uh, will we expect footage on your channel potentially of some Nadam stuff? Yeah, 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 yeah. I haven't shot, this is another funny thing. I didn't shoot any martial arts odysseys in Mongolia. And I think my new uh, method for martial arts odyssey is going to be very few videos, but I'm actually going to hire a film crew. Yeah. Just do like professional quality 
So yeah, so I'm going to do a professional quality wrestling video probably soon now that cool. lockdown is ending. And yeah, we'll do that. We'll do, we'll do one on MMA, one on wrestling, maybe one of those, you know, we'll do different ones, but I'm going to actually hire a film crew. So I got to figure out how to arrange all that. Perfect. That sounds awesome. So for everyone watching, this was Antonio Grespo. Uh, did I say the last name right? Pretty close. Grisefo. Oh, Grisefo. That's right. Italian, yeah, in right? So Grisefo. Yeah. Grisefo and um, or Dr. Antonio Grisefo. There we go. I said it with the doctor and I said it correctly. Dr. Antonio Grisefo, Brooklyn Monk. And of course, his channel will be linked and his books will also be in the ideal list on my Amazon storefront. So for all, those of you, it's a lot for you to click on in the pinned comments. So Antonio, <laughs> thank you, man. Jerry, so nice to meet you. Take care, brother. Awesome.